Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for celebrating 50 years of European policy uh, scholarship, foreign policy scholarship. So I guess we all have uh, our own uh, favorite picks uh, in terms of what we would see as the most important piece of work for us in terms of our, uh, our scholarship, in terms of influencing our thinking, perhaps encouraging us to think about European foreign policy in a completely uh, different way, or something that you think is an underappreciated classic, something that hasn't got the attention that it deserves in the course of scholarship that we've had uh, on, uh, uh, on the study of Europe and of the study of European Union foreign policy. Uh, and what we're going to do here in this session uh, is to give uh, five participants a chance to set out a piece that's important for them uh, and uh, provide us uh, with uh, reasons for why maybe we should read it or, or why they think uh, it's had a personal uh, impact. So I'm going to briefly introduce each of our speakers and they'll flick themselves on and off to wave. First of all, we have uh, Maxine David from Leiden uh, University. Good afternoon, uh, Maxine. Good afternoon. Uh, then we're going to have uh, Paolo uh, Lamoso from the University of uh, Vigo. So Paola, great, nice to see you. Lovely green backdrop. You're in the green room waiting to come in after Maxine. Uh, then we're going to hear from uh, Nile Ewitz uh, Peters from uh, the University uh, of Kent. So, Nile, give us a wave. Fantastic. We'll be coming to you um, in third uh, in uh, our running order. Uh, and then uh, to uh, Tony Hastrup from University of Stirling. Hello. Hi, Tony. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for joining us from, from Scotland. I can see the sun shining. It's, it Fantastic. is. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, and last but by no means least, uh, Ian Manners uh, from uh, the University of Copenhagen. So give us a wave, uh, Ian. Turn yourself on. Wonderful. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, we uh, are in for a real treat, I think, in terms of the pieces of work that people have to uh, introduce. Uh, and um, I'm going to ask all of our other uh, uh, people who are speaking um, to switch their cameras and microphones off uh, apart from uh, Maxine uh, at this time. Uh, and Maxine, uh, over, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to do this. I'd actually already signed up for it before, <laughs> put it in my diary before um, I realized I was going to be a speaker. Um, so let me get right in because I know we don't have much time. The piece that I'm talking about is George Medelsky's 1962 publication of his 1954 PhD, A Theory of Foreign Policy. Um, I wanted to talk about something that had been very much formative in my thinking. So I had three guiding thoughts. My first question to Richard was actually whether I could talk about a piece on foreign policy versus European foreign policy. And for me, that was important because it was my starting point to just think about foreign policy more generally. Also, I wanted to talk about something from the older canon of works and especially something that may not be familiar to everyone, but which I felt everybody should actually read. I hope, therefore, that this is new to at least some of you. And then my third guiding thought was that I wanted something theoretical but that also suggested an analytical framework. And that is because now that I teach foreign policy, I see how students really struggle to see the utility of theory and quite frankly, that distresses me. So um, while there are problems with uh, Modelsky's uh, attempt to, have, to put together a grand theory of foreign policy, I think that nevertheless, it is a good example of how theory can be operationalized if scaled down. Um, Modelsky's book is very much an important reminder of the need to read widely, to remember that the wheel was invented, but that you still need to understand um, the component parts and you know, to go with that wheel metaphor to think about how the, the hubs, the spokes, the rim, how they really all connect together. And I think that he does an admirable job 
in this regard. So the book's important because it's a very rare attempt at a grand theory of foreign policy. Um, Modelsky begins by emphasizing the importance of deduction and an analytical approach, but he later really marries this with an emphasis on empiricism as well. He had two aims in the book to provide a descriptive frame of reference of foreign policy and secondly to examine the relationships between the various categories that were contained or are, are contained within the frame of reference and together he postulated they would allow for the formulation of a theory of foreign policy. Now, the book is very important for me in terms of how I define and think of foreign policy um, generally. So he talks about the foreign policy problem as being essentially a question of adjusting the actions of states to each other. This was also an early work reminding us that policymakers are supposed to work on behalf of their community, something that uh, my, my government at least seems to have forgotten. Um, and it is a guide to actiness, right? To helping us think about actors, um, about their representative status and function, as well as their ability to act. Um, and he set out very early on this difference that I suppose today we would conceptualize as the principal agent distinction. So you get a hint at that decision-making versus implementation approach. I've also often wondered if um, Putnam read Modelsky. Now, Modelsky doesn't speak in terms of levels of gains, gains but he does speak of inputs and um, outputs, so about the own community inputs and about external actions and how they affect um, any actors' foreign policy. And he sets a nice clear objective for us as foreign policy analysts, i.e. to throw light, he says, on the ways in which states attempt to change and succeed in changing the behavior of other states. Just very quickly, um, he's very useful on continuities in um, foreign policy. Uh, he focuses on past actions, speaking of them as power liabilities. Now, I think this is a particularly useful idea in relation to European for foreign policy where those power liabilities occur at all levels. Um, if we have time, I can talk a little bit um, in the questions about an interview that he gave in 2014, where he was talking about multi-level governance and, European, um, and the European sphere. Um, so we often talk about um, these power liabilities in different terms, but I wonder actually um, whether if we centered on them more, if they would be more analytically helpful, but also potentially impactful in policy making terms. So since I've been um, thinking about this again, looking at my notes on Modelsky, I've been wondering why have I not really thought about this in relation to EU Russia, the EU Russia relationship. Right, so there's endless evidence of these liabilities on both sides, um, but I, but yeah, I'm not sure that I have really thought about how that part could be applied. So again, thank you, Richard, for inviting me to do this. Um, I think it's also to remember the period in which Modelsky was theorizing. All right? Also that he was born in uh, Poznan in 1926. It's hardly surprising, therefore, that some of his examples are centered around post-war West Germany. Um, but when he's and when he talks about his three-part characterization of liability, it's applicable much more generally. So the first one, he talks about the obligations accruing as the result of benefits received. The second one about past weakness, and the third one as bad reputation. And I think that all three of these are so applicable to the study of European foreign policy. Um, but this was no static theory, right? The theory also captured the dynamism of foreign policy. Um, Modelsky talked about how, yes, the focus needs to be put on the maintenance of resources, but also at the building of new resources. And he talked about those resources very, very widely. So he talked about the, an investment in education, in training, in the, in the military, in maintaining existing relations, but also in sustaining natural resources. So I think in many ways he was quite prescient at the time. 
Um, I think I'm out of time now, but um, uh, I do think that there are some beautiful aspects in this book that are really worth um, thinking about. So particularly his ideas on community. So if this is something that people would like to speak to me, um, ask me about in the Q&A, then we can talk about that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Maxine. And just to remind people, if you want to come in with a, with a question, uh, then raise your hand in the participants, um, under the participants button. Um, if, uh, uh, if you can also see the, the chat, you can sort of talk with one another and, and Heidi uh, has put the, the reference in uh, to the Modelsky piece. Uh, which is was very helpful and we'll, we'll make all those pieces or share all the pieces uh, at the end uh, so people have a note of them. I wonder, Maxine, whether I could ask you first of all, you know, would, when, when did you first read uh, this piece? And did you, maybe a cheeky question, did you read the whole book um, or not? Uh, and, and then the sort of follow-up is sort of what you, what you did with it, if I, could, if I could put it rather crudely. Sure. Um, I, I did read the whole book. I read it, uh, so I actually had a full start on my PhD. I was originally doing something else, and so I, I, the first two years kind of didn't count. I restarted with a different subject. And then I read this in the first or the second year of my PhD. And I have very, very vivid um, memories of sitting in the British Library, actually reading Modelsky, Snyderbrook and Sapin, and Sprout and Sprout. Those three all together within quite a short um, time. Time frame. Um, and yes, I did read it and I have got, the, I don't actually have a copy of the book, but um, I took such copious notes. I have here from the, the notes that I typed up, 17 pages of uh, yeah. single space typewritten notes uh, that, I, that I took. Um, and then I did, I used him in my PhD, uh, obviously in the literature review, but also to think kind of analytically about what I wanted to focus on. Um, he was quite unusual, um, I think, in that, so he was Polish, he spent some time in London, some time in Australia, but 30 years and more of his career was in the US. And I think he was quite unusual for a US scholar in that he talks a lot about principles and since my work was on values, he informed my thinking quite a lot about um, about values, but, but, but I didn't operationalize the theory at all. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that you would have chosen, you know, what is the sort of concept really of foreign policy uh, analysis, you know, rather than something uh, people might think about as you know, a core text for the study, uh, study of European foreign policy or EU foreign policy. And I think it's a very useful reminder of the fact that we do spend quite a lot of time reinventing the wheel actually when we when we try and articulate what we understand by foreign policy and so on. But I wanted to, to press you, if I may, on, on your sort of final point, but when you, or final set of points, when you were talking about, you know, thinking about Russia and uh, Russia's uh, foreign policy. So although you, know, you may not have operationalized the theory um, in, in your PhD and so on, but, but it sounds as if there are things that you've kind of, you've gone back to uh, and, and have informed your thinking about the present. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I'm one of those who looks at Russia as very much part of Europe. I, I, I don't have a problem at all with seeing Russia as European, and I, I find it actually very problematic when people don't. But I think that um, Modelsky gave me a bridge across to those people who don't see Russia um, as European, because when he does speak about um, community, he talks about community as extending beyond the borders of, I mean, he was mostly talking about states. Um, so extending beyond the borders of the state in question. Um, but he very much cautioned against seeing that community as a variable. He argued that it was a structural feature. Um, and he also spoke of that community um, as being the result of foreign policy. And the community is not just um, that of the actor in question. It is not even just the community that is um, that they form with, with their friends. So he actually talks about friends, those who are indifferent, and enemies. And he sees all of these as being part of the foreign policy community. And I think then that... Um, Right, so he also talks about how the pursuit of objectives that appeal to the community or do not 
will actually result in an expansion or a contraction of that community. So I think for me, it's quite useful here, um, when, you know, when he talks about the community as being the present result of the past pursuit of objectives. And I can turn this both toward, now we mostly, when we're looking at EU-Russia relations, we mostly, mostly turn this against the EU. So, you know, looking at Ukraine, it's all the EU's fault because of what they did. But actually, I've always found it very useful for turning it against Russia as well and reminding us of the, uh, you know, of the mutuality of this relationship. So he, he offers um, an understanding of how we might account for change in the EU-Russia relationship and how not only how that relationship might be unmade, but also how it might be made as well. Uh, I'm being very optimistic here because uh, no signs of it at the moment. Well, that's interesting. I, would, I, I was thinking also about, you know, if you, um, if you were going to put this in front of students, um, you know, what bits of it would you and why? Because I think, we, we, I think we've all accepted that it may be unrealistic to, to ask certainly undergraduate and master's students to, to read an entire book uh, these days. But um, that's classic British understatement. Uh, but uh, at the same time, obviously, you know, we, we also want uh, our students to engage with these classic works because we see that, you know, there's value there's value within them. And I always find it sort of difficult to, to slice up something where you prefer that people read the whole. But if you're going to choose a slice um, because you wanted, you know, wanted the student to read it or students to take something away from it, what, what chunk would you choose? Um, I'm going to be horribly academic and say it would entirely depend on the purpose. Um, so I, I use snippets from him when I am uh, talking to students about uh, definitions of foreign policy. Um, but I don't think that he says anything that is particularly different from anybody else. I think it's probably because um, where I find it useful is maybe for students is that he always, almost puts together a shopping list of things that we can point to in terms of the inputs and the outputs of foreign policy. But at the same time, he leaves a lot of scope for that shopping list to expand. And I think it's very, you know, there is a lot of focus on material resources, but what is lovely about it is, uh, you know, especially for a, a work in this period, I think, um, that it really um, focuses on the human agency. And one of the things that I see students really struggling with is accounting for the human behind the decision. So I think that I would, I would probably, that, that is probably what I would point to, that he very much wrapped the human up into how we think about foreign policy resources. And I'm not sure that others do that quite as well as he did. That's wonderful. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Maxine, for sharing your pick. So for, for anybody who joined us late, uh, Maxine had chosen George Medelsky's A Theory uh, of Foreign Policy. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the reference um, in, the, in the chat function. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for sharing, Maxine. Uh, and if you have uh, a question for Maxine, you can obviously quiz her directly on the chat. Uh, and for uh, our following four commentators, you can also uh, throw up your hand, uh, raise your hand through the participant function uh, and, uh, and come in uh, after, uh, after we've had the, the intro to the work. That was great, thank you. So now we're gonna to move to, to Paola uh, Lamoso from the University uh, of uh, Vigo. Uh, and um, we'll follow the same format that uh, Paola will get a chance to to introduce uh, her pick, uh, and uh, and then we'll throw things open for a discussion. So, Paula, over to you. Hi, Richard. Thank you. Thank you to Norti and to Richard for having invited me to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the EU foreign policy with all of you. So, my choice for this colloquium is the Teresa Novotna article entitled "The EU as a Global Actor: United We Stand, Divided We Fall." This is my choice because I felt it is valuable for understanding the weaknesses and the strength of the current EU performance in foreign policy. But also because Novotnat uh, is part of this new cohort of academic women 
that uh, work on foreign policy, I feel that it was used to be a niche for, for men. So uh, this piece of Novonat uh, focuses on the EU response to the event, events that took place in 2016 in order to assess its image as a global uh, actor, building from the categories established by a previous article from uh, Pomorska and Van, and Van Honaker the same year. So these are uh, the EU as a diplomatic actor, as an strategic actor, as a defense and security actor, as a regional and interregional actor, and as a trade actor. As we might all remember, 2000, 2016 has been a particularly anus or revelous for the European Union, having enormous consequences on its global image, not only because uh, UK owed Brexit, but also the migration crisis divided the continent and uh, populism and radical nationalistic parties arose. Novotna concludes that uh, un even under these difficult circumstances, as the ones that I have uh, already mentioned, if there is common will among member states and EU institutions, the EU can deliver an efficient response. Therefore, the key to a successful EU foreign policy, Novotna argues, is to unit synergies be be among uh, all actors uh, that take part in EU foreign policy. So the article starts by assessing the EU performance as a diplomatic actor in, in Brussels. In this regard, Novotna underlines the success of Mogherini in making EU foreign policy more effective and visible. In addition, uh, Novotna also uh, underlines how Mogherini got to strengthen her leadership within the European External Action Service and also that the European External Action Service became more autonomous. After that, it assesses uh, its role as a strategic actor. And in this regard, um, uh, Novotna underlines the um, EU well, Mogherini presentation of the EU global strategy, which was defined as a response to a more connected, complex, and contested world. It was considered as a success, and since it was presented just one day after the Brexit vote, um, some academies consider it as a perfect diplomatic response to this Brexit cataclysm. Then, in the area of defense and security policy, and directly linked to the presentation of the EU global strategy, uh, the article uh, highlights the implementation, the presentation of the implementation plan on security and defense. After that, as a regional and bilateral actor, uh, the article focuses on the, on the EU performance in its neighborhood uh, regarding the uh, refugees crisis, particularly in the signature of the agreement with Turkey in order to stop the flows from, the, from Syria, but also uh, regarding the migration partnership framework that the European Union uh, launched with other with five uh, countries in Africa in order to deal with the uh, root causes of uh, migration, but also with the um, transit countries. But Novotna also stresses other uh, agreements and the work done with other regions in the world, apart from its neighborhood. And in this regard, an example is the 20th anniversary, anniversary of the ASEAN summit, in which the um, this time a declaration focused on connectivity and terrorism, or the boost of the EU-India strategic partnership, etc. After that, as a trade actor, the article focuses on the TTIP and CETA negotiations, highlighting how both of were both of them, sorry, were put into question. In the case of the TTIP, the problem was in the side of the US because of the Trump election as a president and its uh, project of America first, first and very nationalistic. However, in the case of the CETA, the problem was within the European Union and the article highlights how disagreement among and within member states can uh, provoke a uh, strong harm on the global image of the European Union and its reputation as a global uh, trader. Finally, as a multilateral actor, uh, Novotna underlines the, um, the signature of the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, which appoints the European Union as a climate leader. To conclude, I think this piece of work is particularly valuable for, for studying EU foreign policy because it 
emphasizes this key argument that for the European Union foreign policy to be effective, it is particularly taking into account this complex global scenario and also the contestation within the European Union, it is necessary and mandatory to have all EU foreign policy actors, which means member states and new institutions working together. Because only when member states and new institutions work together towards achieving a common goal, the EU uh, is able to shape the, the global scenario. So, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Paola. And, and just again to, to point you to the chat, uh, to where you see the full reference for the piece uh, published in an outstanding journal, Journal of Common Market Studies. There are other EU studies journals available, uh, of course. Uh, uh, the, the piece, the EU is a global actor united, we stand divided before the EU as a global uh, actor by Teresa uh, Novotna. So, Paolo, and this is an interesting choice, and I and I wondered, thinking about your own um, your own uh, research uh, sort of career and developing interest in the EU uh, as as an international actor, whether it had any uh, direct bearing on your on your thesis, or were you quite well advanced by the time you you read this? Was one of those pieces that you're reading alongside doing your own early research? Yeah, I, I read it uh, at the time of doing my PhD and it is connected somehow to the idea that I wanted to emphasize through my, through my PhD as well that uh, in regarding foreign policy, EU institutions are still relevant, even though it's, a, it's an intergovernmental uh, field, but uh, step by step or as the time goes by and the treaties keep uh, going on, the EU institutions got more power and is the case in the, in the last treaty, the Treaty of Lisbon. And it, after reading this uh, piece of work, it uh, made me think how I should keep researching on how the European institutions influence the development of the EU foreign policy and how necessary is that all of them work together, particularly under these current circumstances after Brexit, after uh, this um, uncertainty uh, in the global scenario where the European Union can no, cannot longer trust its traditional partners, so it has to deliver on its own. So it's more necessary than ever just to work together and to strengthen the, the EU power in foreign policy. So I think in this regard, the European uh, Union member states cannot longer count on, only on their own, but they have to be supported by the EU institutions and they have this willing to take part on the EU foreign policy, particularly the EU parliament. So I think uh, the European parliament will continue to, to, to project its power on the EU foreign policy and they will work very hard for influencing the development of the EU foreign policy in the future and member states will hopefully be happy about it. Thank you. And I, I was going to ask, unless this, I think, fits uh, with, with what you just said. I mean, was, do you think the article was very much a product of its time? Um, obviously, it, it covers, you know, what is happening at that time or just before as far as the EU policy development is concerned. But I wondered about, um, you know, how, how you would anticipate it having a long shelf life. You know, what's in there in that article you think that sort of justifies coming back to it uh, now and in the future? I think it's interesting to take into account towards looking at the, EU, at the evolution of the EU foreign policy in the future because I think it is the turning point and that's the reason why I decided to bring it to bring it into the discussion today because I feel 2016 is a quite remarkable year for the development of the EU foreign policy and the events that took place at that time they were enormously important for the EU global image and they will be they will keep being relevant in the coming year. So I think the 2016 the event that took, that took place at that time, they will have a, a very serious impact in the future development and things are not going back to normal, so to speak. So I think this is the new reality and I, that's why I think this article is valuable because it is like, okay, this is the new a global scenario that we have. This is the new challenging uh, scenario that we have to deal with. 
and the European Union needs to readapt how it uh, performs in foreign policy regarding the, the current circumstances and the future circumstances. That's a really interesting point, and I wonder whether um, uh, other people may may share your view and are willing to share in the chat whether it is a sort of watershed moment, you know, when it, whether it's one of these points in time uh, in which there is obviously both a, a shift in the in the set of practices on the part of the EU, but possibly also the scholarship uh, on on European foreign policy. I mean, you know, I suspect those who've been looking at European foreign policy uh, for longer periods of time may have their own sort of watershed moments, whether it's Maastricht Treaty, Lisbon Treaty, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. If you look at patterns of scholarship, I mean, treaty change has always done quite a lot to sort of boost mm -hmm. interest in different aspects of European foreign policy, hasn't it? But here I see this very much as a sort of blended piece. It's both about you know, institutions, uh, actors, but also uh, practices, I guess. Is, is that mm. your view? Yeah, yeah, it's like a change, the whole change in, the, in how the framework of EU foreign policy evolves, not only because of the actors that are involved, but also on the problems that we need to face. And the, like in a strategic point of view, who will be our next partners and how we need to, to work with them and the, the different topics that are rising. And maybe the European Union is not ready yet to give a common response about the specific challenges that uh, are now here with us, but still it has to, to deliver. Um, yeah, and she has to, to be great creative in this regard. Right, and, and if you were thinking about, you know, using the piece uh, for, for teaching, um, uh, and you've got students sitting down and reading. I mean, what, what would you hope that they're going to bring to the seminar? You know, what's going to be for you the, the sort of outcomes or the learning outcomes from engaging with this piece uh, and you'd want to, to pick up on in a, in a seminar type setting? Maybe the first thing that they, I would like them to, to realize is that um, even though foreign policy is a field uh, for member states, they don't have to pay only attention to member states, they have only to pay attention to the whole framework because everything has uh, something to, to say in that, that first of all. And also that maybe they have to realize that um, it is necessary to be more open mind. So we don't need to only uh, focus on our partnership with the US, for example, or maybe changing dramatically and focusing on Asia, but we have to keep all these fields open and to be um, very assertive in trying to, you know, to look to the different uh, opportunities and not to be only confident on our traditional partners. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, uh, Paula, for, for sharing uh, your uh, choice. So just to remind people, it was Teresa uh, Novotna's piece, the EU as a global actor, united we stand, divided we fall. Uh, the EU as a global actor, published in JCMS uh, in uh, 20, 2017. And again, uh, the full reference is, is up on the, the chat for those who want to uh, pursue it uh, or to engage with uh, Paola through the chat function uh, as well uh, to see whether it's a piece that's also uh, inspired you uh, or uh, a piece that you're un unfamiliar with uh, and perhaps want to know a little bit more. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Paula. You. So uh, we're now going to move on to uh, uh, Neela Ewers Peters, who uh, is based at the University uh, of uh, Kent, um, which is an institution that uh, I wish I'd had sight of uh, over the last uh, three months, uh, and I'm sure it's still there. Um, Nile, over to you. Well, thank you, Richard, and thanks everyone for uh, joining us today to celebrate 50th of European foreign policy. Um, my choice is uh, a special issue by Jorgensen, Obertu and Shahin uh, with the title The Performance of the EU in International Institutions and uh, was published in the Journal of European Integration, so another good journal on EU studies. And um, I basically chose a special issue because it has followed me or I followed it uh, throughout my studies beginning from my undergrad, my postgraduate and then my PhD. And uh, in this special issue, um, as the title already tells, um, the, e, uh, the contributors examine um, the youth engagement with and within internationalizations and institutions. 
and they assess how it basically performs in uh, its Europe in its foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis these organizations. And what I really like about it is that it has a very clear analytical framework which is set out in the beginning and uh, it covers a good variety of uh, policy areas including um, which is obviously very important now health policy and the EU's relationship with the WHO um, as well as trade so with the WTO and with the World Bank but what I personally found interesting and uh, relevant for my own research was on um, the EU's relations with the United Nations Security Council and with NATO. And uh, in fact, this, uh, all, this um, special issue actually sparked my interest in analyzing, examining the EU's relationship with other organizations. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, so what I really liked was the analytical framework set out in the introduction, uh, which really helped my own research and advance my own analytical framework uh, for my PhD thesis later was to look at uh, how the EU sets out its goals towards other organizations, um, how to measure uh, effectiveness, so kind of how has it reached uh, and achieved these goals, how relevant is actually the EU for other international organizations, so how relevant is it for NATO or United Nations Security Council or WTO and the World Bank, um, how efficient is it and also how, uh, what is the financial viability, so basically is it actually well equipped to uh, interact and engage with other organizations. And what I personally found interesting is that these contributions um, also include other factors, not only the full factors set out in the, in the introduction, but also looking at the international context. So putting these, uh, the analysis into uh, a context of what's happening in the world at the moment or back then in 2011. Uh, and also look at the domestic politics and domestic EU politics and obviously we also all know um, what are domestic EU politics and um, it does take into account the, the European wide scene but also individual member states. Um, and so again, this is why I chose this, this piece is um, since my own research is uh, focuses on the EU's interactions with um, NATO and um, what member states and how they interact um, within this corporation. And so I found the two uh, articles by uh, Blavukos and Burantonis um, interesting on the Security Council and uh, looking, uh, looking at how the different members that actually, who are members of the, uh, the, permanent, uh, the permanent members of France and the UK in the Security Council and how they interact between the EU and the Security Council, but also um, the, in, the contribution by Nida Greger and Christine Haugewig on the EU-NATO relationship, obviously very interested for my own research. Um, and I think this, this uh, special issue makes a significant contribution to the study of European foreign policy because, especially because it's what um, Paola said earlier, how can we conceptualize the EU as a global actor and how the EU um, deals with other actors. And um, from what I, at least what I, my own studies were in the, my undergrad and my postgrad were, the EU is always interacting with other states, but actually it pets, uh, puts a good emphasis on also how it's interacting with international organizations, how it can be um, on eye level with other organizations such as NATO, and um, what is missing to be, to be on eye level, actually. Uh, in addition, and also um, what I found really interesting is when I read through the contribution is how one can learn from one policy field for another policy field. So I started off reading just the two articles uh, relevant or for European foreign and security policy, but then I realized when I reread it for the second or third time that it's actually interesting to look at how does the EU deal with the World Bank, um, for example, and WTO. So what can I learn for maybe security affairs as well? Um, so I think. Um, it's a very readable um, and really, really easy to read um, contributions. Uh, and I think um, as a whole, one can read it as a whole package of contributions. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Lille. And again, you know, for those who are unfamiliar uh, with the piece or pieces in the special issue, um, you can find the, the full reference on the uh, on the chat function. I'd be interested uh, from others uh, who have read the piece or, or used the piece if they 
uh, are willing to share on the chat, um, you know, how it's been useful for them. I think it's very interesting that, you know, we've reached a point in the study of, of sort of EU foreign policy that we have uh, specialisms or, or areas of specialism, you know, have, have emerged across time. And this, this area looking at the sort of role of the EU in, in other international institutions or the interface with other international uh, institutions is a very, uh, a very rich uh, field now. But I, I wonder, Neil, if I could just sort of press you a little bit to, to go into a bit more detail as to what you, you mentioned that, you know, you looked at it undergraduate wise and, and then uh, it stuck with you uh, all the way through uh, to your PhD. That's quite a long while for something to stick with people, but, and also to get to the PhD and actually to, to use bits from it uh, to, to organize your own thinking. Do you mind saying a little bit about that, about you know, how it sort of directly impacted aspects of your own research? Um, I guess I'll dig back to my undergrad. As I said, my undergrad was based on European foreign policy, just EU, US relations, US, uh, Russia, uh, EU, Russia relations, EU, China relations, EU, other relations, but it was never on EU and institutions. So uh, I actually found that piece myself. I think that was something I was really happy about, that I found that they actually met my, matched my own research interests. Um, and what I really liked about it was just, yeah, um, that when I read this one piece, like one, one, uh, one article, only two years later, I actually realized it's a special issue, that there's more about this uh, research on international institutions. As you said, now it's a rich field, but I think back until 11, it wasn't as rich. There was not much work on it. And I think um, uh, I think a year later in 2012, there was a book published by Jorgensen as well about the, how other institutions um, influence the EU's um, activeness uh, internationally. And I think I might need to link these two, um, two contributions. So the special issue and the book. Um, and um, I, it stuck with me to think because it was always on my file somewhere. Where it's like a, like a, I've got a file that I need re, I need to reread these ones again and over time, and uh, every time I read it, so for the third time, there's something still in it that I think I missed the previous time, and I found that now, after I gain more knowledge and other from other publications, that something is more useful now. So for me, especially, is with um, the. So first I read the, the article by Nina Greger and Christine Haugerwick about the eu NATO relationship. I was like, okay, cool. But only later, my, fir my third reading, I read the introduction. I think uh, it should be the other way around. But when I read my introduction, I think it all made more sense. And also it made more sense how to look at the EU's behavior with uh, other organizations as well. So with the Security Council was then my other interest for me. Well, that's interesting. So your kind of original discovery was a bit of off-piste reading that you mm -hmm. you discovered it uh, uh, yourself. So it was your own own initiative. But it's also interesting what you say about maybe the way that we interact with with special issues now. You know, the sort of special issue used to be designed or thought of, uh, as thought of in its entirety, and because most of us don't read academic journals um, uh, uh, or, or read them in the hard copy format you know we tend perhaps to come across an individual article first and they often get published uh, online first not as a not as a totality uh, that you would have uh, you know you sort of come in at one, one part of it uh, and then then worked your way back which is which is really uh, interesting so uh, you know taking taking the piece or the the pieces uh, now, um, is there anything in there you, that you think is a good kind of jumping off point for uh, a new project, something that you'd quite like to, to take from those pieces and, and look at in more detail, sort of inspired by the work in there or, or using, uh, using a framework of analysis? Um, I think, I mean, considering what times we are at the moment with COVID-19, I think probably not me, but other people might be interested in reading um, the EU's relationship with the WHO. Maybe there's some insights now for people to understand what the EU can do these days to, um, to counter COVID-19 measures or how it can behave and how it can become an international actor in the whole health policy, potentially. Um, personally, I think, um, it's not my research, I guess, it's not very helpful, um, 
but I think what I where I found some similarities were with the limited ability of the EU to to engage is with the NATO and um, the World Bank and I think the World Bank has been a, been a an important actor ever since the financial crisis. Um, so I think I might reread that article again to see whether I can draw some similarities or how maybe the EU's performance has improved and how the EU might have achieved more goals um, in 2020 compared to 2011. Do you think that's also a bit of a neglected field as well? You know, the sort of monetary diplomacy, if I could call it that, of the EU? Uh, I mean, I guess where people's depends on where people's interests lie. If you are interested in, in financial issues, I've not been really interested in financial issues, but um, um, even though it's very important for other fields, so the EU's um, financial relations is also important for how it can uh, potentially. I've not done any research on that. How it can acquire more weapons and capabilities for the security sector. So I think uh, I'm interested in linking these two again and seeing where the linkage is and where the EU's performance in one could maybe also influence the other field. And, and if you had to choose one piece from the special issue, you know, if people couldn't, couldn't read uh, all of it, uh, what, what piece would you pick or what piece would you recommend rather? I think still the one I started with is probably the EU and NATO relationship, um, just out of interest. But I think um, if I had to recommend this, art, uh, this special issue for someone who I don't know where the research field or the research interest lies, I would say, go into the special issue, obviously read the introduction because it's a summary of, of the findings of all of them, then choose according to your own research interests. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for uh, sharing the piece with us. And, and uh, a reminder, the full reference is on the chat. Uh, on the special issue uh, on the performance of the EU uh, in international institutions, which is a special issue of the Journal of European Integration from, from 2011. So thank you very much, uh, Nile. That's so uh, moving on, uh, uh, it's now over to Tony Hastrup from the University of Stirling. Uh, Tony. Let's uh, hear, hear your pick. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Richard. Um, I picked a, an article rather than a book because I didn't want to saddle everyone with having to read a book. Um, and my article title is From Conditionality to Operation Artemis, Humanitarian Intervention in Sub-Saharan Africa and Local Agency. And this article was published in 2006 in Studia Diplomatica and it was authored by Oliva Ritazibua. Uh, so why did I choose it? Uh, lots of reasons. Uh, I did go back and forth about whether I wanted to choose something that um, people might have heard of. So for example, Roy Ginsburg's um, Egan International Politics, Baptism by Fire, which is quite uh, useful for me when I was uh, starting my PhD, or um, Egan as a Global Actor by um, Vogler and Bretherton. But I thought that this was an important moment to acknowledge a few things when we're thinking about the 50 years in um, EU foreign policy. So this piece focuses on the relationship of the European Union, but also the predecessors of the European Union, so the community with Africa. And when you look at this relationship, one could not argue that EU started its foreign policy 50 years ago. I will calculate it to be at the very minimum uh, 63 years. And why do I say 63 years? Well, in uh, the Treaty of Rome uh, that established uh, what we know as the EU now, um, African countries were inscribed uh, into, into sort of this treaty that was fundamental to European integration and to the founding of European integration. And yet we don't think about this as being foreign policy because we sort of just accept that, you know, surely that's a relationship that they should have, even though it was defining a lot of what we would consider to be foreign policy today. And because I had, uh, this is some of the questions that I had when I was starting my PhD. And in fact, going back to this piece was sort of um, going back to my PhD. 
even though I used it, uh, the main reason I used it while I was in my PhD was sort of thinking about ideas of what local agents and what local agency could look like. Um, so there was that. But we're also in a moment where the EU is trying to renegotiate its relationship with Africa. So again, this first region where it's articulated its foreign policy, where it's grown as a foreign policy actor. And we're at the cost of a rene renegotiation of what is currently the Cotonou Agreement. At the same time, we have a, what I would consider to be a global crisis, which has uh, influenced um, current activism around Black Lives Matter. And yet, this is initially a narrative that we see in European studies and in particular EU foreign policy. So instead of thinking about all of that together, um, I thought that this was a useful um, article to engage with. In that sense, um, even though it's an article that is very close to my heart, I wouldn't say that it's um, necessarily uh, very theoretically sophisticated. I would say that there are other articles that have been written by the author that I think explain more um, where uh, this uh, ideas are coming from. But nevertheless, I wanted to sort of pick out a few things from the article that I thought people might find interesting. So fundamentally, this article critiques uh, the current framework of EU-Africa relations. It tries to do that by first questioning the idea of human rights and how human rights discourse has um, been infused uh, within the EU's justification for a lot of its engagement in Africa. It tries to link the this specific understanding of human rights and the part of the EU, which is considered to be one of its core norms, with the ideas of humanitarian intervention. And here it defines humanitarian intervention um, to an extent quite narrowly, but also to an extent quite broadly by thinking about interference that um, disrupts uh, domestic affairs to a certain extent and thinking about uh, coercion, which is another element of intervention, um, as being beyond, um, beyond malicious intent and something that can happen even when the intention is good. And here, Rutuziba argues that um, this kind of uh, parochial uh, humanitarianism is very problematic because although the focus is on human rights, uh, human rights is often then in juxtaposition to human needs around uh, food for ordinary people and human dignity. And so the argument then is that in the EU's, um, in the EU's undertaking its foreign policies in Africa, human dignity doesn't really feature. And one of the reasons why human dignity doesn't feature is because when the EU does intervene, and here, um, Ruta Zippo is not just talking about intervention in sort of military terms, and in fact, she starts from the sort of economic interventions that we've come to associate with EU-Africa relations. Um, this actually creates a lot more disruption that can lead to um, very, 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 very bad um, unintended consequences. So here, um, uh, the Rwandan genocide is very much a, uh, a shadow uh, in terms of understanding that particular relationship. And I think, um, I mean, when we're sort of looking at what's happening now, whether you think it's 50 years or you think it's more than 50 years that EU foreign policy started, I think this is, these are still issues that um, are important in terms of the policy practices of the EU policy practice of the EU, not just with respect uh, to Africa, but in particular with respect to Africa. So as I said earlier, we're currently on the eve of renegotiating what is currently the Cotonou Agreement. We know from ongoing negotiations that they've been quite um, fra you know, fractured, um, despite the fact that the EU has been quite emph emphatic about wanting to build a partnership with um, African actors. So to give one example, uh, the African Union, um, which is a, you know, a, an intergovernmental organization, has sought to negotiate on a continent-to-continent -continent basis. 
And the European Union has been very reticent and that's been very polite about how the um, EU has approached negotiations. It has tried to break ranks um, amongst African countries, going, of course, to the poorer countries and trying to negotiate on the side, even though it claims that it's invested in regional integration and it's invested in this um, ongoing ACP relationship. So I take very much um, to, uh, to heart a quote that uh, Ruta Zibwa um, cites in this uh, particular piece. Um, and it's a mossy proverb that says, um, that sort of translates to if, um, if one slips on a mat that is uh, borrowed, one is indeed sleeping on the floor. And of course, this is something that has often plagued EU-Africa relations, um, both in, in its theorization, but also uh, practically, which is that if the EU is the one um, who has all of the power, and we talk about asymmetry in almost every piece that is written about EU-Africa relations, um, if the EU is, um, you know, is the more powerful in this asymmetrical relationship, to what extent can local agency um, be exercised, to what extent can ownership or partnership indeed be fundamental uh, to this relationship. And I just want to end by saying that, you know, this article is not, um, is very clear that it's not naive and does not suggest that, you know, all of a sudden um, African countries will uh, be wealthy enough to challenge the EU. But it's actually putting the challenge to the EU to say, if you actually are serious about achieving what it is that you say you want to achieve, but also importantly, repairing this relationship that's very much embedded in um, colonial power relations and they're manifested in the everyday lives of Africans in Africa, but also Africans in Europe, then we need to be a bit more reflective about uh, both the origins of this relationship, but also its practices as um, quite coercive, um, even in non-military terms. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. And, and again, the, uh, the reference to the piece, Olivia uh, Ruta Zebra's piece is, is in the chat uh, for those who are uh, unfamiliar with it. Tony, can I, can I start with something that you, you opened up with uh, when you were introducing the piece, which, was, which is the kind of dating, dating of, of European uh, foreign policy or you know, Europe's, Europe's engagement uh, uh, internationally. Uh, and uh, and I think it's probably fair to say that we've we've had a bit of a separation until arguably fairly recently between some aspects of the EU's relationship with the world outside itself um, and and some bits of its foreign policy. And to put it rather crudely, you know, people have sometimes got more excited about the CFSP and the, the CSDP than they have about other strands of the way that the EU's engaged uh, uh, internationally. And I wonder whether 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 the piece spoke to you for that reason uh, or 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 am i or did i mis misunderstand what you said no no i mean i think i think that's part of it that you know oftentimes people um talk about um cfsp 92 um and then more recently a uh, csdp but actually one of the reasons why uh, this particular article spoke to me is because uh, towards the end of the piece, Ruta Zibwa says that, you know, it was a deliberate choice not to focus on um, development versus trade versus security, because in the constitution of EU-Africa relations, this were always very much wrapped up. But what is also fascinating, she doesn't really talk about this, but sort of in when I was sort of thinking in terms of using the work, is um, one of the reasons, you know, why we date uh, foreign policy differently is um, because even though this foreign relationship was articulated within the Treaty of Rome, and despite the fact that we were moving very, very rapidly, very clearly towards decolonization, a lot of European countries did not see Africa as being apart from them. And therefore, it was there for them to do whatever it is that they wanted with. And I think, of course, this is still very an important conversation in foreign policy more broadly, um, even outside of Africa. Well, that, that, that um, leads very nicely into my second question to you, which was about symmetries, because asymmetries is obviously something that you, you picked up on this piece and something that you know, is very much a theme of, uh, uh, within your own work. 
uh, I think. So whether whether um, uh, this as a this as a piece uh, is something that you felt had kind of articulated that in a way that you don't feel uh, uh, appears as much as it might. Um. So okay. So if I understand you correctly, do you, do you mean um, asymmetries? in the article, but we don't see that in other literatures or that it doesn't articulate it as well in this piece? No, I think it, we don't see it in other literatures. So I think ah. that's, that's what I meant. But, but also, if I may, is to say that it's, I think it's also something that you've, you've, you've looked at all sorts of other asymmetries as well. Yeah. You no, personally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yes, this, um, in a way, this piece, of course, does focus on the impact of the asymmetries between uh, the EU and Africa, but also tries to say we need to look beyond our almost obsessive focus on asymmetries as an explanation or a justification for why things are as problematic as they are. And in that sense, it gives, um, I think, a better insight to, and it's just one insight, and I think it's important to highlight that, uh, to some of the mechanics of the relationship that might help us sort of rethink the relationship, but also help us rethink the EU as a foreign policy actor. Now, in the, and I think, you know, going back to the second part of your question, this part is very important. So in some of the work that we've obviously done uh, with uh, Roberta and Catherine, but also uh, with Laura Chappell around gender, where there's the tendency that when we're talking about gender, we're just talking about gender equality policy. And we, you know, we've made a call that we need to start looking more broadly at the different practices of the European Union, both as an internal, but also importantly as a foreign policy actor and what it's actually doing, not just what it says it's doing and not simply looking at gender and gender issues as a policy area but infused within the broader practices of um, foreign policy in this particular instance. So of course the symmetry features a lot in, in how we understand the EU but I think we also need to look beyond it um, a bit more as a simple explanation for our practices and sort of think about um, how do we intervene for progressive purposes. In, in a slightly different uh, uh, direction, um, you know, this, this piece for students, uh, when, would, when would you uh, imagine using it? You know, when you're introducing students, you're teaching a kind of intro to sort of, you know, Europe in the world, EU foreign policy, whatever uh, course. Uh, and, you know, when would, when would you introduce it and, and what would your expectations be from what students would take away from it? Right. So if I was teaching it in a module, it would probably, so say I had a module called Europe and the World, um, which wouldn't just be about foreign policy. I think I would introduce it at the section where I'm looking at EU foreign policy or I'm looking at a, um, foreign policy practices. So moving away just from the theory to sort of looking at uh, the practices. Um, it would probably be best to introduce it to an honors uh, student, um, at the undergraduate level, so I wouldn't do it in the first or the second year, just not to scare them away from uh, either EU studies, uh, um, African studies, or global studies for that matter. Um, and one of the things I would want to highlight um, if I was presenting to this to them is another, another viewpoint, right? So one of the things I always say to my students is when you're reading a piece, I think it is important to also look at the author. And I, I mean, I think one of the usefulness of having this conversation is that we actually do have to engage uh, to an extent with the positionality of the author. And I think, um, you know, Maxim has done that really well. And I think it's important here. Uh, I can count on my uh, one hand how many people of African descent actually work on the EU, uh, but specifically on EU foreign policy. And I can also say for a fact, because I know all of those people, that we've very much been influenced by our location within the academy and therefore our interaction with all the objective pieces of work, but also our location within, um, you know, the globe, so to speak. And that very much sort of directs the sort of research we do and our aspirations for what we think a better world should look at. 
should look like. And if my job as a teacher is to not force feed a certain view, but actually to sort of think about the ways in which my students can be better citizens, um, then this would be sort of the motivation behind why I would assign something like this in addition to sort of learning a slightly different history um, of European foreign policy. That's brilliant. Tony, thank you very much um, for sharing your piece, which was uh, Olivia uh, Zebra's piece from Conditionality to Operation Artemis, Humanitarian Interventions in Sub-Saharan Africa and Local Agency, which was published in uh, Studia uh, Diplomatica in uh, 2006. So thank you, uh, Tony. Now finally, uh, we'll turn to Tuian Manis from the University of Copenhagen. So the same drill, uh, Ian will introduce the piece and then we'll uh, open up uh, for, for questions or for comments. Ian, over to you. Great, thank you, Richard. And thank you to all the other presenters. Um, I must say, I very much enjoyed uh, looking at and reading um, the articles, uh, particularly Olivia's pieces. I did take the time to look at some of her more theoretical pieces and I, I found them extremely interesting. And I would encourage everyone to read um, more broadly into some of the readings set out for today's session. Um, what I want to do in my uh, five minutes is talk about uh, a book by a scholar called Catherine Guisson, uh, possibly the, the book on EU foreign policy you've never heard of. Um, and in particular, uh, I want to set out why I chose this book, what it has to say to us and, and what it's talking about. Um, so to do this, I want to firstly talk about why I chose this book. Um, when I was asked to present a classic on foreign policy or a European foreign policy, I, I couldn't think of any. Um, that's not because there aren't any. Uh, it's just that I can't think of any one book that's shaped my thinking in this area. Um, instead, uh, I, I, I reflected a little bit on those books that had over time shaped my sort of intellectual thinking, autobiographical, I suppose. Um, of course, immediately, you know, growing up in Thatcher's Britain in the 1980s, I thought of Stuart Hall's works. And then uh, traveling in the later 1980s and seeing um, the systematic destruction of the global ecology, I thought of James Lovelock's work. Um, but over time, uh, particularly as a student in the United States, I encountered the work of Hannah Arendt, um, a vast collection of different works, a somewhat idiosyncratic, which makes them difficult to talk about and difficult to think about in terms of European foreign policy. So in the end, I chose a book by Catherine Guisson called A Political Theory of Identity in European Integration. Um, and the reason I chose this book is it is, in fact, an Arendtian piece on how to think through European integration and European foreign policy in terms of political theory. Indeed, it's probably, for me, won't become one of the most interesting and perhaps important books on European foreign policy that no one's ever read. Um, it's quite novel in the sense that it doesn't just use the work of uh, Hannah Arendt, but draws on the work of, for instance, Paul Ricoeur, um, Charles Taylor, um, Jürgen Habermas, and did so long before anyone in EU studies was reading these books. I, I should say the book is actually her 2000 PhD from the University of Minnesota, which was updated uh, into French for a 2003 French language production, which was then updated in 2012 into the English language. So it's a, a work that has grown over time. What it does that's interesting, I think, is it, it anchors itself in political theory. It talks about uh, European integration in those terms. Uh, and then it thinks about what we can learn from this in the study of EU foreign policy. Now, for anyone uh, I'm sure like you and me that have tried to explain European Union foreign policy, the, one of the most difficult questions is what is it for? Who is it for? Um, Maxine set out at the top of the session uh, that European or uh, national foreign policy is for the, the state, um, but then who is European foreign policy for? And this has always been a, a question which has worried me, particularly in the context of, of st studying and advocating the study of uh, normative theory, something that wasn't done when Richard and I first started studying uh, EU foreign policy. Um, 
just to summarize the book really quickly, it sets out a number of principles that it, it, it uncovers through a hermeneutic approach. That's an interpretive approach based on using interview methods to ask questions of people that have been involved in European integration or have been witnessing European integration over the period 1950 to let's say 2012. And it sets out three specific principles which are of interest to us. Um, first is the idea that European integration is fueled by the, the memories and beliefs along the lines of the principle of reconciliation. Um, but what is interesting in the book is she extends this to the study of acts of reconciliation, the Franco-German act of reconciliation, reconciliation in Central Europe between Greece and Turkey, and then in a chapter on foreign policy between Kosovo and Serbia, of course, a, uh, an act of reconciliation still in process. The second principle that she studies and thinks about is the principle of power as action in concert, an idea I'm sure that you're familiar comes directly from the works of Hannah Arendt, and studies CFSP as a power of action in concert. And for my thinking over the last 20 years, this is inordinately important. Um, people ask me, what does normative power mean? Well, it's you know, the power to shape the normal. Well, what does that mean? Isn't that simply he hegemony? Well, it depends on whether you think power is for yourself and yourself alone. And the action in concert, of course, breaks that kind of rationalist thinking that power is always for you at the expense of others. Um, the third principle she sets out in the book is the principle of the recognition of the other, in particular the study of EU relations with Turkey and acts of recognising the other. Why do I think this book is interesting in studying EU foreign policy? For, for one thing, if you read these principles the other way around, you get actually a type of a logic of what is EU foreign policy for? Um, to bring about recognition with others? Um, to try and change and shape the world with others? and to bring about reconciliation, as um, Tony has just set out, in the context of long-standing 200 to 500 year old patterns of imperialism and uh, colonialism. In conclusion, uh, one of the comments I would make is that reading Hannah Arendt and reading Catherine Guisson's um, work based on Hannah Arendt reveals some interesting stories that I think sometimes we need to think about. Arendt was acutely aware in the 1940s of the processes of European integration that were taking place then and wrote a number of pieces warning of what could go badly wrong um, if European integration wasn't done right, in particular the extent to which the EU ran the risk of um, not addressing anti-Semitism, racism or imperialism and simply re reproducing uh, larger structures in the, the mirror of the chauvinism of European uh, colonies and empires as they were, German, Italian and French. Um, and I think for me today, this acts as a, a reminder of why we study the EU, why EU foreign policy is interesting and what we need to think about when we try to make sense of it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ian. Uh, you're also accompanied by birdsong that you probably couldn't, uh, couldn't hear. Uh, yeah, that's very, my audience. Very soothing. Um, yeah, this. I, mean, I think that um, you know, as a as a choice, it's an interesting uh, one. Uh, both, I think, in terms of the demands it makes to the readers, because I think it is a it's a it's a demanding book, and probably, I think, it'd be fair to say, only the most advanced student uh, could could uh, take on take on the book. But I was also interested in uh, in in why it, it appealed to you initially, uh, and in particular, um, you know, you were started off. I think it's fair to say, by being interested in sort of beliefs behind uh, symbolism, yeah. uh, and whether you know whether that's one of the reasons why the book struck a chord with you. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, uh, my original PhD work in the nineteen nineties was on trying to make sense of the symbolism and substance of European integration, um, for which, of course, you know, people like uh, Stuart Hall and his work on cultural practices and Pierre Bourdieu's work on um, practices as well were, were interesting. But one of the things that, that Catherine's work does is it explains how she does her research and it walks you through how the interaction of political theory, and as you say, um, a political theory that's not always easily accessible, um, and how she puts this together in her examination of memory, speeches and acts. And it is a, a, a study of words and deeds. So in that respect, 
it breaks the sort of somewhat artificial dichotomy that's grown over the past 30 years between a discourse analysis and, and practice study. Um, why I think I engage with her is it, it, it helped me make sense of Arendt in a way that I couldn't see myself. Um, and so in that respect, it's extremely useful, I think, for students that are studying political theory or international political theory and sometimes have trouble putting it together with the study uh, analysis and understanding of the, the EU. I think Tony's comments before about trying to put together the study of, let's say, colonialism and post-colonialism with the study of the EU is difficult because people don't do that um, or haven't done that in the past. And it's not always easy to make sense of these two, two sides, let's say, of, of the study of the EU. And, and uh, can I pick up on the point about method? Because I think, you know, what's also interesting about the book is the method. Uh, and certainly uh, for me, you know, that is uh, quite a powerful takeaway. Do you want to say a little bit for people who may be unfamiliar with the book uh, about, um, uh, you know, the method that, that uh, underpins the analysis? Yeah, I mean, Catherine did something which is in some respects no longer possible in that during her PhD, um, she either interviewed or had interview access to a large number of participants uh, in the processes of European integration. And then subsequently when updating the book, uh, in particular to um, embrace the study of European foreign policy, spoke with participants and tried to get a sense with in particular the, the agnostic, um, agonistic component of those that were engaged on both sides of the debate in, in the, the enactment of uh, European foreign policy. So it is really an uncovering of um, a foreign policy through uh, talking to and trying to make sense of the words of deeds of those who were participating in it. In this respect, it is kind of classical hermeneutics in the sense that you've got to uh, there's an attempt to try and understand and make sense of the participants within the context in which they act. That's really interesting and, it, and there's a there's a bit of a connection here I think with a with a question that's come through on the, the chat that I'll get to in a moment but before, before I do that um, uh, I wanted to encourage everybody um, who was online to to share what would be their must-read uh, classic. Uh, if you don't mind, so you can share it with everybody uh, in the uh, in the chat. Uh, you don't need the the full citation. Nobody's going to get um, low marks for not uh, giving us the page numbers. But um, it'd be interesting uh, to hear from people out there uh, as to as to what you put forward. The question, uh, Ian, from from Baris uh, Selick is: um, I wonder what Professor Manners would have to say about the degree of in, in, engagement with political theory in case studies on European foreign policy. To give an example, some scholars engage with Habermas's theory of communicative action, more as a theory of deliberation and as critical theory. Can we say that political theory is sometimes used rather selectively in European foreign policy? Yeah. More than uh, a yes, no answer would be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, certainly as a PhD student, I, I've been there and I've done that, which is that you if you're in the Department of Political Science or Politics, certainly in the Anglophone world, um, generally political theory is seen as a tool to make sense of your case studies. Um, and I've been there and I've done that. Uh, and I found myself towards the end of my PhD snipping out the political theorists <laughs> that I knew would antagonize the examiners. Um, and I think it's a tragedy, uh, but it is a problem today. Uh, I teach with some of the books that others have referred to in their presentations and some of the articles. And it's extremely difficult to try and get people to one hand think about, right, if we talk about international normative theory and we talk about the European Union and what's it for and what its foreign policy does, how can you apply this to case studies where nobody is really, or very few scholars are thinking through this type of connection or they don't have space within the article to do so. Uh, one of the reasons I chose Catherine's book is it allows you to do that. I noticed from um, Barris's question, he referred to Habermas, for instance, uh, and Catherine uses Habermas. But, you know, of course, Habermas in, in this sense was working from and out of a specific, somewhat strange interpretation of Arendt's work. And I think the way in which um, Catherine uses Habermas to, to try and make sense of um, thinking and speaking out loud is 
probably a more useful way of thinking about it. But there is a terrible problem, I think, of assuming, as you see in too many, I think, IR theory textbooks that Habermas equals critical theory. So when I talk about critical social theory, I tend not to do Habermas because I think it's, it's so problematic in that respect for a variety of reasons. So yeah, I mean, it, it is a very real challenge. And in the absence of good textbooks that do this, it is actually quite difficult to do this with even, in my case, master's students taking a course on, you know, the EU as a global actor, for example. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Ian. I wonder if I could call back uh, all of our um, all of our presenters, if you're willing to to flick your uh, cameras uh, back on, because it'd be great to see uh, the full panel uh, all together uh, at one time. Um, uh, I wonder whether whether uh, any of you uh, had had a chance to to reflect on. Uh, any uh, any of the other uh, presentations uh, and whether you're willing to say whether pieces you hadn't come across before that uh, your appetite's now been uh, whetted on a bit more or, or suddenly realise that uh, actually um, the piece that you presented wasn't really the piece that you wanted to present uh, and you've suddenly <laughs> thought of something that was far, um, uh, you know, uh, let's say stimulated by the by the, the choices of others uh, to, uh, uh, to take a look at. So don't, you can raise your real hand rather than the blue hand uh, if you wanna be a, uh, a human. Um, uh, so Tony, Tony's gonna come in while I have a quick look at the chat and see what others have said. Right, um, I, um, well, the books that Maxine and uh, Ian have suggested, I, I don't think I've come across them before. I come across Maxine's book and it was probably one of those ones I put aside because I was like, yeah, I'm not really doing foreign policy still. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> but now <laughs> I think that I really have to go and engage with it if I can find it. And um, certainly as somebody who's, um, I mean, I would say probably, you know, hands up, avoided theory for a really long time. But as I'm... Um, sort of moving more into works that look at um, race and racism and to sort of use the Livia's term, um, epistemic violence. I've been quite uh, fascinated with the more sort of theoretical work on EU and EU foreign policy. It probably doesn't help that I often divide my uh, brain between sort of um, the EU, Europe stuff, and then the African Union, Africa stuff. But certainly I, I think, you know, um, I'm very intrigued by the memory in um, the book uh, because I think, I mean, for me, it's becoming a recurrent thread in my thinking about EU foreign policy in Africa, especially. So thank you, thank you both. I mean, I'll come to Maxine in a moment. One of the things I'm always, I'm always struck by, um, particularly from people who are outside looking at European foreign policy questions or Europe's place in the world, they, they'll often uh, make, the, make the observation that, um, that the, the study of, of sort of Europe's place in the world is, is untheoretical, and, and, you know, which I always find a, a bit surprising. I mean, I think there have been periods of time in which it's been atheoretical, uh, and, and actually for quite a lot of uh, the time in which people have studied European foreign policy, I think it's been atheoretical, but I don't think it's been uh, untheoretical uh, at all. Um, and um, uh, and I think we you know we've got a lot of we've got a lot of good recent uh, uh, corrections to that view uh, anyway. But Maxine, um, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I actually wanted to ask uh, Tony a question because um, I, I think that certainly you can't you you can't do anything in foreign policy generally where you are you do not feel the influence of the psychologists right so it's one of the reasons why i really do like uh fbs and sprout and sprout that that they are there from a, a very early time um but i wonder how much you know pr pretty much everything that i have read and relied on has been written in a western context so I'm actually wondering whether um, Tony thinks about the psychology, is driven to think about the psychology um, in her work and whether, you know, from those foreign European foreign policy works that she has looked at, whether she thinks that that is kind of well represented as a field, is it, is it fit 
for purpose or something. And, and one of the reasons that I'm asking is because uh, I recently had a, not a spat, but a discussion with somebody on Twitter about um, the relationship between language and the context into which you're translating. And this was in the context of racism and they were asking, well, you know, they were asking Russians to say, how would you translate people of color, for instance? And then I was looking around and there were so many discussions about racism in different contexts, mostly Eastern European contexts or um, Western Balkans. And um, there seemed to be, everybody was talking about the history, right? That this was the thing that really impacted on how people in those locations thought about race. And it just seemed to me that there must be something kind of psychological about how we think about race and and yet none of that was kind of coming through in those discussions at all so i'm just wondering if if anybody has any thoughts about any of this i suppose right okay so um <laughs> oh <laughs> that's an intense question okay so i don't know if i agree that there's a psychology of it there's a sociology um uh but i think maybe that's an ontological perspective on, on my side. I think, you know, we're all human beings and in terms of psychology, those sort of distinctions perhaps uh, is not as evident, but the sociology matters where you are located and the impact of specific histories, whether you're um, in Central Eastern Europe versus, um, I don't know, uh, Sweden or the UK, for example, really matters, yeah? Um, because I sort of think uh, when I was growing up, when Czechoslovakia was still Czechoslovakia, right? It was a better place for my family members to go for further education than the UK, for example, because of communism and uh, the relationship between, uh, <laughs> uh, well, not the relationship, but the proxy relationship between uh, the Soviet Union and the United States and the engagements in Africa was very different to what it is now. And yet, for my contemporaries, it's not um, an easy, easy space to navigate, whether the Czech Republic or uh, Slovakia. So in that sense, um, history matters, uh, sociology matters, uh, but I don't know if it's psychology per se. And that is not to say that psychology doesn't matter in thinking um, about race, but I think that is then more individualist. It, it's more individual, if you see what I mean. Whereas I think when I'm thinking about, um, maybe in specific context of EU African relations, I sort of think about the cohort and what, what is determining why we're not looking at certain things, uh, which I would say is more sociological, but certainly the way people behave and the choices people make I, I can see how psychology would definitely play a part. Ian had a comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was related to that question. Um, when I introduced some of the readings, I suggested that uh, Stuart Hall's work had been important in trying to make sense of um, the, the symbolism of European practices. Um, but it's not simply the symbolism. His, his work talks about cultural representations. How do we know what we know um, and he was writing within the context of neoliberalism um, and questions of racial identity in the 1970s and the 1980s but it, it does become extremely useful format and framework particularly his representation and reception theories to understand how the notion of what is foreign policy and what isn't and what is good foreign policy and what is bad foreign policy gets represented to us in everyday media uh, the, you know, the question of Brexit in that respect is um, you know, an absolute classic where uh, everything is a representation and everything needs rep reception theory to make sense of it. Um, but it's doubly important when we study the EU and, and what's going on with, with uh, the climate emergency. It's very difficult to break out of our existing cultural practices because they're written for us. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I would always advocate, and, and somebody asked a question online, you know, how, how can we incorporate these kind of approaches? Well, uh, I actually get the students to read reception theory in almost all the classes that I teach, whether it's political cinema or EU foreign policy. Um, we, we um, unbelievably, we've run out of time. That, uh, that, um, 
you know, uh, talking about reading, if I could put it that way, um, is, uh, would not be something where we could s sustain a conversation. But I've got, you know, I've got a page full of questions uh, here that I can bug uh, you uh, about individually um, but, um, uh, in the future. But I wanted to, to thank uh, all of you for sharing, also for those who have shared on the chat, because there are also some alternative suggestions there. And uh, Emily uh, at UACES has been kind enough to say that she would collate uh, readings for anybody else uh, who who wanted to to share uh, their um, their pieces that they would encourage people to read. And I think this is sort of start of a conversation rather than the end of one. So I hope we can do some more. Hopefully not in lockdown, um, but actually face to face. And uh, let me thank um, uh, our uh, our sharers, if I can call them that. Um, uh, Maxine, uh, Paula, Nile. Tony and Ian, um, you know, for um, for both selecting, which I think is a tough thing to have to do, and then being willing to um, to talk uh, about what their choices were and why. I mean, I found it really interesting uh, and uh, and a great opportunity to reflect upon what's important in terms of my own readings. I hope everybody will take that away as well. Uh, stick with this channel, uh, I would say. Uh, thank you again to all of our speakers. Thank you for all of you who, uh, who uh, attended uh, virtually. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, engaging with you uh, all again in, in similar events. So thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.